everyone. And today we're going to uh, look at some very key background concepts again uh, that uh, especially focus on the idea of co-evolution, which is a concept that originated in evolutionary biology again. Uh, and there's an interesting story about this, which is that in 1862, Darwin was on his way um, back through, I, I think it was in Madagascar, and he saw a specimen of an orchid that you can see there, a uh, sort of plant, uh, and it has a, a very uh, long, uh, what's it called, a nectary, which is where the nectar is at the bottom, so the, the nectar, including the, um, the pollen with which it f is fertilised, it, it just seemed too, too long and weird to be functional. Uh, and he thought that the only way it could work, because we know that insects pollinate flowers, was that there must be some moth with a really outsized proboscis that would poke all the way down into this nectary. Uh, and then five years after that, this will be very familiar for people who know about arguments by fundamentalist Christians and fundamentalists of other religion in favour of the so-called intelligent design. Uh, in those days, it was this guy, George Campbell, 8th Duke of Argyle, published a book called The Reign of Law. Uh, and he said, look, the complexity of species is evidence for creation by a supernatural being. Um, and then Alfred R Russell Wallace, uh, sort of Darwin's fellow creator of the theory of evolution in a way, he replied with a paper called Creation by Law, and he gave a co-evolutionary account of how that could arise. And that picture there, it, it's not a real picture. You'll see that there's a couple of moths hovering in the background with their outsized proboscises. Um, and that's an illustration based on his prediction. So he said that there must be moths like that in order for fertilisation from these very long nectaries to occur. So it then took another um, 40 years before anyone caught this moth in action. Uh, or not, sorry, not in action, they just found the moth. And then they didn't actually see it in action, that is plunging its proboscis into the nectary until 1992. So that's 130 years. Uh, and I mention that partly because it sets things up for this, our discussions of co-evolution, but also that I'll be talking about transition issues in how complex structures arise in language and how you can put a hypothesis and it can take you a very long time to find examples of those things in action. Now, that idea of co-evolution is used in many fields now. I'd just like to give some nice examples from anthropology, a neighbouring field, uh, from this book actually called Co-Evolution, Genes, Culture and Human Diversity. It's been out for a couple of decades now. But it's a really interesting book with a lot of case studies. So, for example, uh, Plural marriage there, he looks at all the different possible marriage patterns, polyandry, polygamy, two brothers marrying two sisters, ghost marriage, same-sex marriage, all of these things are played out in one part or another of the Tibetan plateau among different dialects of Tibetan according to ecological conditions. So, for example, if brothers have, one brother has to go off on a long trip you know, with salt, uh, on, the, on the back of an animal and he's going to be away six months, it makes sense for the other brother also to be married to the same, same wife. So there are a lot of local adaptations of um, social structure, but then there's biological adaptations like sickle cell anemia in malarial areas, adult lactose absorption, so we know that people have different degrees of lactose absorption according to whether their ancestors were pastoralists or not. Incest taboos, they don't take precisely the same form uh, in every part of the world. He argues that headhunting is an ecological adaptation to being Sweden farmers, where you, you need to maintain that there's a large 
regeneration space so that things regrow about every 15 years and being headhunted makes make sure people that your neighbors don't get too close um, basically uh, lung and blood adaptations by Tibetans to high altitude environment these are all cases where cultural choices by human societies and how they organize their life and where they live are linked to biological adaptation so you've got co-evolution between a cultural elements of a cultural system and the biology of populations. Now when we apply these co-evolutionary ideas to, to language, I think there are four levels at which they are played out. So one is the very obvious level at which we are physically adapted to, to use language. Uh, things like the um, the larynx, the tongue, the ear, that the physical input-output system, uh, and the cultural software of language. So, for example, if it had been the case that we shifted from predominantly gestural systems to predominantly spoken systems at some point, that would have then put evolutionary pressure on things like a, a degree of tongue control and lowering the, the velum and things like that. Uh, so we can think of this as, if we think of the analogy of computer software, that as software evolves, there becomes a need for new hardware. Someone thinks of using a mouse or touch-sensitive screens or Wi-Fi, and then new, wi uh, the new software has to be developed to, to deal with that. Or it can go in the other direction. So that's a little bit like the effects of language evolution on the, you know, the parts of our bodies that deal with um, language. Then there's another sort of twin track selection that we can call the double life of language. So we'll, I'll say a bit more about this a bit later on today. That is, language is at the same time a psychological thing. I could be the last speaker of a language. We know people like that who, let's say that they are you know, the only surviving speaker of Ilgar or something. At that point, it's no longer a social institution. It's just there in the mind of Charlie Waraga or whoever the person is. But it's also a social institution shared. Uh, and changes in one part of those tracks can affect the other part, but in a rather complex way. And then there's the co-evolution of language and culture. So, for example, if we evolve uh, particular ways of signalling honorifics or if there's a culture that's particularly interested in location by um, the compass or if, if there's a culture that talks about kinship a lot, for example, these are all things which may end up affecting what gets grammaticalized, what's sometimes called ethnosyntax. And I'll say more about that later on uh, in the third uh, one of these uh, meetings. And finally, at the shortest time span is language cognition coevolution. So that is, uh, as you are socialized or inculturated in a particular culture by learning a language, uh, that can have an effect on how you think and process it, it, what Dan Sloban called thinking for speaking. Okay, so there the, the feedback is from the, I guess, the social institution of a, of a language to the psychological processing preferences of individuals who learn that language. So we can have, this is just a sort of sneak preview. Uh, these are mostly things I'll be talking about next time, but it's useful just to give you an idea of the sorts of things. So this double locus selection, the fact that things are being passed back and forth between individuals and societies, allows what we can call learner bottlenecks. So each individual, as they try and learn a language, they're exposed to a non-random set of variants, but they also weed out the things that are difficult to learn or to process. So there's a constant uh, effect there on what they then in their turn transmit to their peers or to their children or whatever. Uh, and that allows us to produce these systems that iterate very small changes over many generations. Uh, then we have what we 
might call um, transmission biases. So, so what is it that makes some things easier to learn than others? And uh, we'll see that uh, this plays an important role as well. And, and exactly what the biases are might vary according to the population. Um, and then uh, these things are multi-selectional. So a language as a complex system is subject to, I would say, hundreds of different selectional factors. And those are all playing on them at once and that can produce a, a wide range of solutions. Uh, I've put a quote there which I'll um, come back to later on that basically the more things you have to satisfy as selectors, the larger the number of equally efficient design solutions there are. If, you, if you've just got to uh, satisfy one selective uh, factor, then designs will converge. Uh, so there's some, some work there we'll talk about. Uh, and then by saying that there are two loci to introduce variation, uh, we could say, adopt some motto that you know, indiv individual change proposes. This is uh, how do changes arise? They arise originally as mutations in the speech of a single individual, but then they are propagated out through a social uh, system and down through the generations, which can amplify uh, weak biases. And then these transmission uh, biases uh, there are a huge number of these, that, and this will be the main topic of the next class. So social factors, possibly even group size, cultural factors, uh, we'll be looking at some cases of that. Um, genetic differences, which has been a sort of taboo topic for linguists for since Boas, really. Uh, but in the last 10 years, through work by Dan Dedu and other people like that, it, it's there's renewed interest in, in this topic. So, for example, uh, um, tone, uh, is tone more likely to arise in uh, particular populations according to some genetic features, or are cliques more likely to arise in particular populations and so on? And there might also be epidemiological biases. So, in the Australian context, the wide incidence of otitis media, that is, inner ear infection, which reduces sensitivity to high frequency sounds has been invoked as an explanation for why Australian languages don't have fricatives. So, so that's not a genetic thing, but it's an epidemiological thing. Um, and climatic biases, we'll, we'll see examples of that as well. Uh, okay, so let's pass on. This is what I mentioned, this twin track selection. This is just showing it to you uh, in diagrammatic form. Uh, so we've got uh, what might happen in uh, an individual, uh, the changes they introduce, and then at different time points, as because what you say is learned uh, by others, they will gradually show up through changes. And you know, every linguist knows about things like this through study of historical change or um, grammaticalization from say something like Latin cantare habe or to French chantare, that's not something that's happening in the course of one, uh, one generation. Now, there was a really important book uh, written by a German linguist called Rudi Keller. And uh, this was the second book in a series he wrote. The first was called The Invisible Hand in language change, which picked up ideas originally coming from economics, actually. And it's interesting that in economics, invisible hand theory is the sort of the vehicle of the right wing. You know, that's all the sort of market economists and people. Whereas in linguistics, this tends to be more on the left, if you think of the sort of functionalist as being on the left uh, in linguistics. But uh, it's useful here because one really important difference between linguistic evolution and biological evolution is that as users of language, we are people with intentions, with communicative intentions, uh, 
speaking to people with intentions and we model the anticipated communicative intentions of the people we speak to. So that's probably going to have an effect and it's an obvious objection to simple-minded applications of evolutionary biology to linguistic systems. Uh, so he introduces this idea of phenomena of the third kind. So what he calls phenomena of the first kind are the unintended products of unintentional acts. So anything arising in evolutionary biology like an eye or something like that, no, there's no one setting out to say, look, we've got to have eyes in our population. Uh, it just happens as, as unintentional tapeworms or whatever, you know, m try and move towards the light. Then at the other extreme are phenomena of the second kind, which are the intended products of intentional acts. So we can think of the Cathedral of Notre Dame or the Napoleonic Code or you know, people setting out to design a really great system or computer, computer scientists coding a nice program. You know what you want to achieve, you're, you're on top of your field and you deliberately and consciously do it and, and work it out. And of course at some points in time people have seen language like that, probably the Académie Française sees their relation to, to French as being um, like that and maybe even the French language as being like that. Uh, but it's of course a forlorn uh, hope. Uh, so the third the phenomenon of the third kind, as Keller uh, points it, is that these are um, the unintended products of intentional acts. And this plays a really big role in all human cultures, I would say. Now, we can give really simple examples of this. So the equal length queues in a supermarket, which arise, they don't arise because people say, let's form equal length queues. They arise because everyone wants to get through as quickly as they can and they have, you have agent-based decisions. Okay, that one's a bit shorter, so I'll go, go there and you even things out. Or what are called desire paths or desire lines, which are really cool things. It's just where, for example, people create a path by going where they want to go. And I don't know how well you can see that slide. Um, since I come from the ANU, which has one of the most poorly thought through systems of actual concrete paths. And constantly there are desire lines that are cutting shortcuts around those. The University of Michigan apparently had a much more enlightened approach. They didn't put any paths in when they designed the campus. They said, we'll just wait for the students to walk around, see where they go. And then when they've done that, we'll put the paths there. So that's a map of the University of Michigan campus. And you can see the little desire lines uh, there, which are you know, examples of phenomena of the third kind. Well, this is happening all the time in language in lots of ways. So for example, the way that um, semantic change occurs, the, the fact that usually when people form euphemisms, they're just for thinking, oh good, I can form a nice expression like you know, concentration camp or toilet or something that won't cause any offense. But before very long, uh, that's gone its own way, picking up uh, meaning. But there's lots of other things. So, for example, um, lots of patterns of sound change, overshooting, hypercorrections, where um, people uh, put H in because they, they want to put it in, but they're not actually getting it right, or vowels, where, let's say, a low status group is trying to sound like a high status group, but they don't quite get it right, so the high status group moves away. And we know what everyone is intending to do, but it's not a fully thought through, um, fully, uh, what would you say, conceived set of uh, acts. And then that sets uh, various things in train. So then we can think of the interactions of the biological evolution and cultural evolution uh, I'll say more about this really important book and program uh, of uh, Morton Christensen and, and Nick Chater creating language, but they have this model that they call the um, bottleneck model, processing and learning bottleneck. So they start from the uh, observation 
that as language users, we are having to do things at incredible speed. We have to uh, understand and produce utterances in time frames of the order of you know, tens of microseconds. It's very, very rapid. And then it's gone. That is, if, if Hillary says something to me and I haven't remembered it or I haven't processed it in time, then too bad. It's gone. I mean, unless she writes it or something. Uh, so that will constantly filter out things that are hard to process. And as you learn, if you haven't already processed it, it's not going to get through into what you learn anyway. So on their model, that produces very, very powerful constraints on what we can and cannot do. Their model on its own doesn't say whether that those constraints have to be the same in all populations or not. And nor does it set out to provide, you know, like a comprehensive set of constraints because there will, of course, be many things that we don't know. We, we don't actually know, for example, whether it's harder to process polysynthetic languages than analytic ones that used to be the belief. And there's been interesting work done with Murin Pata, for example, showing that, no, it's not actually the case. Kids don't seem to find it any harder. So I think there's lots and lots of things where to put substance onto this, we still have work to do. Um, but the, the basic model is a useful one, I think. So the way they put it is that um, this bottleneck functions, the language system must, the language system by a user must eagerly recode and compress linguistic input. It must be easy to do. It must fit congenially with our cognitive apparatus. Um, and that bottleneck recurs at each new representational level. That is, if you're under time pressure, you're under time pressure. Whether you're talking about a phoneme or a word or a phrase, you still have to get your next utterance out you know, within some number of microseconds. So every level of the language uh, system is subject to the same, um, the same constraints. And uh, the, the system has to deploy all available information, uh, get it right first time. You can't backtrack. You can't rewind uh, and, and do it. So these are very strong uh, constraints. And then, as I said, uh, since language acquisition is learning to process, in a way, they're the same things, right? Because you're not going to learn something that you haven't been able to process in the first place. So that can sort of tell us how individual variants uh, come about or get weeded out. Uh, they can also tell, that can also tell us how that process can apply down through time. But because humans are social beings and leave, live in populations, it doesn't really tell us how they get pro propagated out through the population. Uh, and that's where work in sociolinguistics, especially variationist sociolinguistics, uh, comes into play. Uh, the, we can think of the Morton and Christiansen approach as dealing with what Weinreich and Herzog and Leboff call the actuation problem. How does, it, how does a change arise? How does a variant arise? But then the next step is the transmission problem in their terms. That is, how does it get out through a speech community? And that's an interesting and tricky question because we'll see, especially in the next session again, uh, and especially the last session, that sometimes what seems to survive are perverse structures. They seem to be more difficult than other ones. Uh, and there it may be that the ones that do that, let's say, suppletive verbs or really complicated phonologies or things, they, they probably shouldn't arise just on the Mortensen and Christensen model. But if they're taking on an additional function that is signalling group membership, expensive signalling, as it's sometimes called in biology, is a good social method uh, because that means that people have to have been there in your group from the beginning or at least invested enough time in being in your group that they didn't just sort of cruise in, learn the language, start cheating you or whatever that the way outsiders are usually uh, perceived to, to behave. Uh, that's a little bit like so-called so sexual selection in biology. So if, if you think, what good is it to a peacock to have a 
peacock's tail of that size or to a reindeer to have a massive antler. It's, it's not actually functionally helpful, but it does help you win the battle for mates. Uh, and the reason it's said to arise is that it shows you're such a fit individual. You're doing so well on other grounds that you can afford to invest in this complex, terrible tail or complex, terrible antlers and so on. So uh, I'll say more about how to bring those ideas to bear on some of the weird structures of language uh, later on. But for the moment, the point is that it's the variationist approaches that have allowed linguistics to escape from a conceptual deadlock, which was more or less the same deadlock for de Saussure and for Chomsky, although it's located in a different place. So both of Saussure and Chomsky, in a way, um, posited social uniformity. Now, in the case of Saussure, we don't know what would have happened if his second course that was on the parole would have come out. Maybe he would have dealt with this. But just looking at the first course, which just sort of quickly brackets off parole and then doesn't talk about it anymore, uh, he has this memorable line. Uh, I'll just quote the English version that it, it, language exists in the form of a sum of impressions deposited in the brain of each member of a community, almost like a dictionary of which identical copies have been distributed to each individual. Language exists in each individual, yet is common to all. Speaking is thus not a collective instrument, it's manifest. Speaking, that is, that, well, there, if we go back to the French um, trans, uh, originally, il y a donc rien de collectif dans la parole. So, so it, it's uh, there that um, he's talking about individual things. Right? But then he didn't ever tell us what he thought about parole. But the first part, uh, of language, he's really got this notion of exact uh, copies, which doesn't make it easy to explain how change occurs. And then Chomsky also had this sort of uniformitarian view, but now he just saw it as predominantly a psychological phen phenomenon. He wasn't really interested in language as a social phenomenon. So he had this famous quote that he was interested in the idealised speaker here in a homogeneous speech environment. Again, this, there's no room for change or variation in that he brackets out variation and social factors. Then along comes Lebov, as we know, and you know, really puts variation at centre stage uh, and, and, and his many co-workers and followers uh, and built, uh, of, built on uh, Euro Weinreich's idea of the dire system, that is a system of systems, which is a very interesting idea um, that you know, one could do more with. But uh, Lebov really got down to sort of individual variants and just looking at very small things like do people say, you know, running or running or, or whatever. And, but studying them at enormous levels of social detail where you've got control over social variables, male, female, age, um, social class, and, and so on. Uh, so these you know, amazing methods for confronting variation uh, for the first time allowed us to see that there was much more variability out there in a population and what, what's more important, possibly, that individuals don't just have one way of speaking, that they style shift according to who they're, they're speaking to. So now we start seeing variation as the key to understanding change. And I'll just put that same slide up, which I put up in the first class, that um, the mutation, that is the individual levels of change, then starts to get distributed in interesting ways through a population, microevolution. So we can think of you know, Lebovian approaches as coming in at that point. But then that actually creates some huge problems because you might say, oh, that, that, okay, we know how to proceed then. We just 
go, uh, you know, and look at our micro variables, and then we see how they evolve, and on we go to, to look at macro variables, as, as in this lovely diagram that Lyndall uh, Bromham uh, made for us. Uh, but in fact, it's very hard because most of the changes you see at the level of, if you're a linguist, going from populations up to language differences or even dialects up to language differences, don't show up. You're left to posit them. Uh, and most of the things that variationists look at, like that example of ing and in or post vocalic r, they don't really help you explain how switch reference arises or something like this. Uh, they haven't been studied and, and it's not all that clear uh, that they can. So I, I want to spend a few slides now looking at that problem. But first, once again, remind ourselves that it's not just for linguists that this is a headache. Uh, so there's a nice article. I hope you can read the reference there. Otherwise, like I said, I'll put, I'll put all the references up at the end of the course uh, called Darwin's Bridge. That is, how do you follow this bridge from microevolution up to macro evolution uh, and certainly when Darwin was looking at say changes in the fossil record um, species differences it wasn't clear what the intermediate forms were although luckily Darwin also had a great interest in plant breeding uh, and it was in that, that that's where he was really looking at you know selection of small-scale var variants but still when we look at nature that is the things we have evidence for there's loads and loads of discontinuities around and we have to work out how to get from one point to another in those discontinuities. So uh, let's just look at some examples here but first of all let's put forward a strong hypothesis what, which we can call a micro to macro hypothesis which would be that all large-scale differences at cross-linguistic level so the sorts of things that you might see in Wiles or Grand Bank or uh, a hugely expanded uh, version of that, which some think of something like that, that takes in all of the structural difference we want across the world's languages, so tonal versus non-tonal or SOV versus SVO, it all originates as some form of variability at the level of speech community. So that somewhere, maybe at a point in time which is no longer observable in the history of a given language, the, the alternatives would have been present as some form of probably sociolinguistically distributed uh, variation. But just like in biological evolution, there are evidential gaps. There are things where we don't always find evidence for um, the co-varying uh, possibilities there. So that gives us a sort of ambitious program that we should set ourselves as linguists which is to, to really understand the roots of typological variability we should be studying the genesis of all relevant typological variables um, as sociolinguistic variables and it's shocking how few of the typological variables appear as social sociolinguistic variables if you just look at you know textbooks in social linguistics. So when we started our Wellsprings of Linguistic Diversity project and began it in 2014, I naively thought, oh, this is going to be easy. We'll just you know, go through some social linguistic textbooks, find where all the variables are, and off we go. And the, the set of intersections was very, very small. Uh, there are some, like, for example, negation. This classic example is lots of studies of, say, negation in French or other languages where you can see the change going on, and that's the sort of you know, typological question. Do you have pre-verbal negation, post-verbal negation? You can see it happening. But for most things, you can't. So, so I'll call bridge features variab variables which can be studied at both levels. So these are the ones where, you know, looks like we can go in and get going on both types of study. Uh, so examples might be the presence or absence of a copula. So we know that that's a cross-linguistic variable. We also know that even within English, there's you know, varieties of, of English that drop the copula in lots of circumstances. 
or the choice of quotative introducer. Famously, you know, in English, I can say, you know, he said that, or he said like, or he, or he goes, and he, he said blah, 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 or he's blah, blah, blah. There, there's a lot of stuff happening sociolinguistically that corresponds to different um, typological strategies. Or focus markers, or affixal future markers, uh, which is uh, almost that's happening under our eyes with, you know, the evolution of gonna into a future marker in English and so on. Now, a lot of the sociolinguistic variables which sociolinguists are interested in will be just what I'll call parochial. That is, they're interesting if you're a sociolinguist or interesting if you're a particular, interested in a particular language, say English, post vocalic R, great, signals all sorts of stuff, but it's probably not hugely exciting from a typological point of view. Whereas there are other ones which, which are, and you can examine in any language. So here's um, one example of what we can call a bridge feature or where there's micro to macro compatibility. So the future tense, it's a Wells feature, so I chose it. Uh, and there are values there, I don't know how well you can see them there on the screen, but the red is that there's an inflectional feature and the white is that there's no inflectional feature. So if you did uh, French now, of course that should go in with red as it does. Uh, and if you did Latin, it would have gone in red back then, but it was a different inflectional future, but there was some point between Latin and French when it wasn't, and when people were saying, you know, cantare, habi, or, or whatever, uh, that was a periphrastic uh, future. Uh, so that's an example, and you can see this sort of thing going on in lots of languages which are on their way to evolving um, inflectional futures. So a, a really nice laboratory for looking at evolving linguistic structures is usually pigeons and creoles because they're just like evolutionary, evolutionarily accelerated. Uh, so uh, Julian Sankoff who's both a variationist and a creolist, has, has done lots of interesting work uh, on lots of things, but among her work in Tokwisin, she's pointed out that, for example, the, there's an emerging synthetic future in Tokwisin, Papua New Guinea, so the older form would be bai emigo, where bai comes from by and by or something, but then there's an emergent form in younger generations, embigo, right? Where the B comes from the by. So that, so, and then both forms are out there in the population. So you, you can look at that, treat it as a sociolinguistic variable, uh, but it's also a typological variable. So that's an example of a, a bridge feature. So then if we think, well, we're typologists, uh, we look for variability across languages. We know that as typologists, we want to look in all aspects of the language system. So we want to look at phonetic things, so what's the difference in voicing contrast between French and English? We know it has to do with, with timing issues and so on. Phonological questions, is there a cut in the language? Where's the stress placement and so on? Morphological issues like the degree of complexity and morpheme order, what are the infectional categories? syntactic things like word order and alignment, relativization strategies, semantic things like the range of color terms, semantics of perception verbs, semantics of kinship, and many, many things. These are all places where we could, in principle, look for variability. And our standard uh, typological questions that we ask He's, here are some of them, right? So how big is the design space? What, what are the options uh, for each dimension of language? And then what's rare, what's common? What counts as the same or, or different? Which is like, what's really an adjective? How do we decide when something is an adjective? If there's just three of them in a language, does that count? Or, or if they're a sub, sub, sub class of intransitive stative verbs, is it legitimate to say that they're an adjective or not? For example, Nick Enfield 
had a big bit of an argument about with uh, Sasha Eichenwald and Bob Dixon in the adjectives book about whether Lao has ad adjectives or not. You know, it's, it's a complex analytic question, as it is for other languages. How do we operationalise those decisions? I'll return to that a bit at the end of today's class. Then are there functional or system correlations between features? So uh, is there a correlation between word order, OV and VO, and prepositions versus postpositions? Vintage stuff for typologists. And then in diachronic typology, what the pathways of change are. But notice that all these questions are questions about either relations between of one language to another, or of one part of a language system to another part of the same language system. But we can also ask what I would say are socially embedded typological questions. So what gives rise to typological divergence? Why is it so strikingly the case that the languages of New Guinea just go off wildly in every direction, typologically, in a multilingual environment? while the languages of mainland Southeast Asia converge like crazy to the point where if you... Uh, there's a famous article, I didn't put the reference in here, by Ustin Dahl, who looked, used the Wolf's features to say where's the, which languages are the most similar to one, one another. And languages from different language families in Southeast Asia, I think he was comparing Thai and Cambodian or something, so, you know, a, a, a Dai Kadai language and a Mon Khmer language are almost as close to each other as Polish and Russian. And so so the, you've got two languages from different families, almost as close as two really closely related um, Indo-European or Slavic languages. So what are the social situations that create a particular types of convergence? Then whether what I'll call uphill and downhill changes. So by an uphill change, I mean a change that's sort of going against what you would expect in terms of economy and the ease of processing and so on. So let's say you just start having more and more suppletion or anti-iconic word order or... Uh, hmm? Doesn't mean we're on fire or anything? Mm -hmm. no, good. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so... Do uphill and downhill changes um, behave comparably in all types of speech community? Or are there some types of speech communities that favour uphill changes more? And likewise for RARA, uh, are they equally distributed across all kinds of speech community? So another way of putting this is, could you imagine or could the same sort of language be found in any sort of speech community? Or are you more likely to get some types of language in some types of speech community? So Peter Trudgill has you know, famously written in his book, Sociolinguistic Typology, that there are certain types of language that are more likely to evolve. He talks about morphological complexity and also morphological irregularity as a property of small-scale uh, language, language communities. Um, I mean, I've got some issues with that, which I'll return to in the last talk because he has an assumption that small-scale uh, communities are somehow monolingual, which doesn't hold up very well in my experience, at least in some parts of the world. So this brings us up onto the question of multilingualism on types of variation, and then we can unpack that further uh, and say, well, is this like multilingualism where adults come, come in, learn language imperfectly and iron, iron out certain complexities in the language, or is this multilingualism that starts from birth, basically, where you have time to learn all of the exuberant complexity and irregularity of several languages and then start doing cool stuff with it? And are all typological variables equally appropriate for all kinds of social signalling? So uh, if you want to signal speaker gender, is it just as good to use particles and phonology and certain types of morphology. Uh, why not use object-verb order, for example? That's just another type of socially embedded typological question. So now let's look at uh, some of the reasons why uh, this micro to macro gap 
uh, arises uh, and uh, there's five reasons I'm gonna, going to look at. This just gives you what, what they are and then I'll say a bit more about each of them in turn. So uh, the first one that high frequency variables are the ones favoured by sociolinguistics, by variationist methods. Variationist methods work really well if you get thousands and thousands of tokens really quickly, which favours phonemes over obscure constructions, for example. Um, and then it might be that if typological variables are relatively stable, imagine variables that might take thousands of years to change, they're going to be harder to detect in speech communities because there just won't be the variability out there. Uh, and then, fault now of the typologists, the way we do our work, uh, maybe we only code the idealised endpoints of multi-step processes so we actually filter out variability that's there in terms of the coding that we give, which is true of some typological databases but not all, as we'll see. Then there's a really fundamental flaw of how variationist methods are conceived, that is there's an asymmetry in how they deal with meaning and form because once things have a different meaning, basically the Bovian social linguistics doesn't want to touch it because their, their definition is different. Variance holding meaning constant. So then that makes looking at meaning variation rather hard using their methods or even impossible. And then questions of differential availability for social signalling. So let's look at these in turn. turn uh, reciprocals I'm going to say more about in the next class. Um, and I've been interested in these for a long time. But one of the things that's striking about reciprocal, reciprocal constructions, which you probably wouldn't know from the number of papers written about them, is how rare they are in running text. So uh, Zygmunt Freisinger did a count, uh, and he just looked at one of the reciprocal constructions in English. He looked at each other because it's easy to count that. You just go through. Whereas I wanted to look at the whole range uh, because you can also have a word like mutual or one another or you can just have something like, you know, they kissed, which isn't coded overtly. So I, I hand coded up um, a few different texts here. Uh, Zygmunt's uh, one, he found each other over a one million word corpus occurring at a percentage frequency of 0 0.02. So that's uh, pretty low, right? Um, uh, and then according to the uh, text, you'll be proud to know that the, the French text had the highest level of reciprocity, um, Boule de Suif, uh, still not very high, 0.141% then a text of Isabella Allende's was a bit lower. Sense and sensibility, you know, these are all more or less in the same range. And then a travelogue by an American traveling in the Caucasus, Negley Farson, who was a real lone wolf, um, didn't have a lot of reciprocals as he <laughs> walked around the mountains of the Caucasus. Uh, that was one every 0 0.00915%. So, but basically we've got a range of one in a thousand words to one in 10,000 words. You can imagine that doing a variation, a study of, of this, you're going to need huge, huge corpora to get the sort of occurrence levels uh, that you can do anything with. Then stable variables, I mentioned that um, at least according to Joanna Nichols, that there are some typological features which are very, very stable. They're going to change so slowly that it's going to be hard to observe them. Now, we'll see later on that uh, we, I'm putting clusivity here as a sort of um, whipping boy because this is one of the ones she says is very stable. Uh, uh, but actually, um, we'll see a study that sh where you know, there's, there's some changes going on uh, there not exactly inclusivity, but in that domain. But in, just in case there are people here who aren't familiar with it, here's a, a typical minimal pair. So in Kaido, ngar, 
means we too, excluding you, and nakur means we too. Sorry, it should be including you, not including me. Right? So, uh, so there's also another one, uh, naut, which is we more than two, but excluding you, and nakud, we more than two, including you. So there's four we words in, in Kaidal. The third problem is the problem of the missing intermediate steps that we've already mentioned, and that's uh, again shared with biology. So if we say we're interested in the evolution of eyes, um, they, they have been described as organs of extreme perfection. And, you know, they're pretty useful and, and beautifully evolved, but um, they're found fully formed in present-day organisms it's not that every step along the way of the evolution of an eye is attested by fossils or living organisms. There's, there's quite a few steps where you have to postulate things there. And for fundamentalists advocating intelligent design, um, you know, they go for this stuff like sharks for meat. Uh, you can check that blog spot out if you're interested but it's just saying it would be unbelievable that this sort of thing could just evolve through evolution and um, therefore there has to be a god uh, and even more that you would have two of them uh, so that's a problem but i think it's probably not as bad as a problem as we think it is if we do our work properly so let's think about tone and let's start for tone with our friend Wells, um, and there's a chapter on tone in, in Wells by Ian Madison, uh, chapter 13, and a nice map there where you've got three values by colour. So either the language has no tones, or it has a simple tone system, or it has a complex tone system, according to that, right? Uh, now I know there's people here who work on tones and who this will already seem very simplistic to. Um, but, you know, there's Ian Madison, serious phonetician, saying um, for most languages it's easy to determine if the language does or does not make use of tone, but there are surprisingly sharp disagreements in certain cases. And he goes on to talk about Ket, where according to the linguist, Ket's been described as having none, two, four or eight tones. Uh, so it's a bit of an analytical issue there. Uh, but probably what's more serious than that is the lack of intermediate steps. When you display these sort of simple-minded categorizations of states. So this is a sort of hypothetical history, but I'll show you in a moment that it's close to what typical thing that happens in cases of tonogenesis. I, I guess you know about tonogenesis it's in the sort of New Caledonian environment too. And uh, I, I don't know if you... Would we call, pre present his paper on that in this room? It's a beautiful paper on tonogenesis. Mm, yeah. It, yeah. Anyway, th th if we just look at this, uh, this is a typical sort of thing that might happen. So you, this sort of simplified version of it where you've got, say, three syllables, ta, ta, and ta, three possible coders and nothing or a glottal stop or an H uh, and then that produces sort of allophonic um, pitch perturbations such that before glottal stops it's fairly common that the pitch is a bit higher and before H it's fairly common that the pitch is a bit lower uh, and then so at the beginning I've just put those little uh, tone letters in a sort of incidental way. You know, that's not the primary signal. The primary signal is still the glottal stop, but those are coming in allophonically, as it were. Uh, and then a bit further down the track, a couple of generations on, the, um, the uh, primary signal shifts. So it is now the tone doing most of the heavy lifting, although the initial Little stop and H are still there. That's the third step where we've got an sort of incidental coda consonant. And then finally, well, look, well, stop and H, you don't need them after all. You've got the tone doing the work and you drop that away and you end up with a three-tonal contrast. So, right. so if we were to do 
a while's entry and the top line that's fine we just say yeah it's a no tone language the bottom line it's fine we say yeah it's a three tone language but the two intermediate lines is less obvious uh, and however we deal with it if we are being forced to make these sort of simple-minded judgments by a typological survey then we're throwing away the very data we need to understand the transition. Of course you might say it's not the role of a database to show that. Uh, you know, someone can do a special study on it, like this one. Uh, so this is a study by Graham Thurgood. Uh, what's interesting here is this is in uh, Tsap, which is an Austronesian language on Hainan Island. So the Chamic peoples who were once in southern Vietnam and they sort of got chased away. There's still a few chum speakers left in Vietnam, but most of them fled to Hainan Island and they were under heavy Sinitic influence for uh, more than a millennium, I think. Yeah, maybe 1,500 years. Um, there were two more Yeah. From the 8th century and the 11th century. Yeah. So they all end up as nice tone languages uh, and you can see here just um, comparing the last three columns that you know you've got your different tonal uh, contrasts there and the finals influence what ends up as being the tone and you you can reconstruct final coda consonants for proto chamic like h and n and k and so on by the time you get to tsap, they're basically not there. Uh, and, but you've got tonal contrasts coming in, in their place. So there's a, you've also got stuff happening with the initials, which I'm not talking about now, just to uh, keep things a bit simple. Uh, so if you look at that nice study by Graham Thurgood and many other studies on tonogenesis, you can see how those steps arise. So here, in principle, we can find those intermediate steps. Meaning form asymmetry. Uh, standard variationist techniques make it harder to find out about these because people say things, how do you know what they mean? Uh, and that might apply to colour systems or occlusivity. Let's say we go through, you know, we've got 50 hours or 1,000 hours recorded of people speaking Indonesian or Malay and there's you know Kita and Kami uh, the first one of which is um, inclusive and the second is exclusive and then if some if, if one of those is coming to predominate and someone says that how do you know which one it means uh, so that is you have to supplement simple recording with uh, some methods that allow you to know uh, what is being uh, represented then differential availability for social signaling. So we, we know that, for example, vowels on the traditional Eurocentric uh, view of things, especially in the English speaking world, are taken as the sort of ultimate signaling device. You know, if you speak a variety of English, basically, you know, you just have to say a few vowels and people know where you come from what social class is if you're in England, what dialect, you know, whether you're an Australian English speaker or a New Zealand English speaker or wherever it is. Uh, so they seem to be very good um, signals. And uh, I forgot to put this reference in, but Emma Cohen wrote a, a really interesting article about this, arguing that uh, this reflects the fact that it's very hard to change your vowel settings uh, later in life, which probably slightly overstated given how many people rejig their, painfully rejig their vowel systems. It used to be more the case, if, say, if South Africans going to London and wanting to camouflage the fact that they were South Africans and going for elocution lessons and so on. Or Henry Higgins and Eliza Doolittle for that matter. Uh, but that would be an example of something that's good for social signalling. Uh, it's also a frequent social signal. That is, you, the vowels just keep coming in there all the time. There seem to be some things which are quite uh, spectacular in terms of typological difference, and people just don't seem to even notice them. 
So two examples here from Northwest Australia, uh, Murinpata, which is a really complicated polysynthetic language with about 3,000 speakers being transmitted to children, and by now lots and lots of studies of, of it, including developmental studies and sociolinguistic studies. Uh, John Mansfield uh, observed that the relative ordering of pulcal number and past tense suffixes inside different clan lects, so there are all of these different clans that speak it, um, at least in the older generations, the Billabong clan and the Murin Kura clan had different orderings, at least statistically strongly, but no one seemed to notice. Uh, he also pointed out that people from the Murin Kura clan had traditionally been bilingual in another language of the area, which had the order which would explain what they were doing. So you'd think people would pick up on this, but no. Uh, the, the, now, younger speakers, it seems, have just sort of randomised it all. They've grabbed it all, which is what you would expect to happen if it hadn't been invested with social meaning. And then right next door, um, Nick Reed, who worked on Ngangi Shemiri, he found maybe an even more spectacular case where he worked on the language in the 1980s and it was thoroughgoing polysynthetic language by then. Uh, and later on he found recordings uh, or yeah, sound recordings but also a lot of transcriptions made by um, a linguist in the 1930s. And uh, those weren't polysynthetic. There were sort of three big hunks of verb which hadn't yet melded together. Uh, and he read them back to people and said, hey, you, you don't speak like this. I said, yeah, we still, we still speak like this. That's, what, that's how we speak. Uh, and um, it's, well, who, who, you know? And, and like people had shifted from one type of grammar to a rather different one without anyone ever noticing. So, you know, th this is examples of how not every type of variation gets invested with, with social meaning. On the other hand, some things do. So now I have called this slide uh, Crossing the Bridge uh, as a case study in the typology of pronominal number. So just to show an example of how you can investigate these things uh, through uh, one of the doctoral uh, students in our Wellsprings of Linguistic Diversity project, uh, Alex Marley, uh, and she worked on a language called Biningunwok in uh, another polysynthetic Australian language of Northwest Arnhem Land. But before uh, we look at her findings, let's just remind ourselves of a couple of things that happen with pronoun systems. So. Uh, on the top left is the Kaidel system, uh, which has exclusive and inclusive, just like I said. So, nar, we to, like just say, if I say to everyone here, say Amina and I are going to go out for dinner or something, after I say, okay, nar, we'll go out for dinner. That means we too are going out for dinner. Sorry, Hillary, you're not, you're not in on it, right? Um, but then if I say to Hillary, nakor, are going out for dinner, She's invited, mean is not. Um, and then if, you know, I say to Isabel, Ngalt are going out for dinner, it means we're all going out for dinner, but not you, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but if, then if I say Ngakult are going out for dinner, we're, we're all going, everyone, you know, uh, speaker in here. So that's the, the basic system. Uh, now, notice that it's slightly painful for a, a linguist, there's a gap in the paradigm, which we don't like to have. It's sort of, there's an unused cell. You might think it's got to be like that because you can't simultaneously be singular and be we inclusive, because to be we inclusive, there has to be at least I and you. So then you think, oh, well, okay. You just have a sub, you know, only 11 uh, out of the 12 cells there. We, we have some languages. We have one wait, 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 wait to this one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah. the alternative thing, which is probably what Claire's about to tell us about, uh, is what you get at the bottom, where you have a much more efficient system, 
All you have to do is redefine your number to be relative rather than absolute. So this is what happens in Bin and Gunwok. So now you'll notice we now have 12 cells. Is this the sort of thing you were going to yeah. mention? Yeah, yeah. Sorry? So, so what's happening here is that, I mean, we have the you and me form, yeah. right? The idea is instead of counting in an absolute way how many people are in the unit, you would count in a relative way. That is, relative what, to what would be the minimum possibility, normally one, but two just in the case of inclusive, then we start counting from there. So then the ngar moves into that. It's a dual, but we call it minimal because it's the smallest number. And then for the form kane, that will now mean there's three of us because it's added one onto the basic unit of two. And uniquely for that kane, there's, you could say there's a trial, but really it's more elegant to say it's a unit augmented. And then the kari is... Well, for the other three, like ngari, nguri, and kabiri, that means three or more. But for kari, that means four or more. That is, two or more are added on. Okay, so that's usually called a minimal, minimum augmented system. Uh, there are some languages which are a little simpler, just like you have singular plural languages. You have minimal and augmented, and others where you've got that third value of minimal unit augmented, augmented. We might expect there also to be ones with you know, uh, minimal unit augmented, dual augmented, augmented, just in the same way we have singular dual trial and plural, but as far as I know that hasn't been reported. Anyway, these are two different types of organisation, each with their own pluses and minuses. As a linguist, I prefer the bottom one because it's more elegant. Uh, uh, but they're actually not that common, although, although there are you know, a number of Austronesian languages that have them. And the first report in the literature of a language with these was, was it Subanon? It was one of the languages of the Philippines that, yeah, that had that. And then that, that analysis was adopted for some. There are cases in the Santa Cruz Islands. Santa Cruz Islands also, yeah. So it's, it's a bit of an Austronesian thing and a bit of an Australian thing. Too, seem seemingly independently, although it's intriguing that they're in the same part of the world. Uh, I don't know, do you get those at all in the Amazon? No. No. We have very simple systems, but I'm not sure how they function. We use first, second, and third uh, forms of person, but uh, with no number distinction, so uh, mm. I'm not yeah. sure exactly how, how they operate the quantity. So, that, so they're an interesting system, right? And then, it, well, you might sort of complain about the fact that this is invisible to Wiles or to Grand Bank, that is there's no variables in either of those big typological databases that would show this, but you might also know there was a, a typological database set up for the language of Sahul, published in a paper by Kher Racing, Michael Dung and Ruth Singer in 2009, and that had a question about this, although it was a classic essentializing question. Does the language have a minimal augmented system? Which it isn't always. Obviously I picked a clear example to give you but there are less clear examples. So that's an example where you might be interested in how do you get between those and can we find languages that are in, tr in transition uh, between them. So enter Alex Marley's uh, PhD. So Bin Gunwok was a language that had had a lot of work done on it. I'm actually going to talk about this on Wednesday in the Grammar and Typology uh, Conference. Uh, and we'd already begun to look at some interesting differences between dialects and so on. But what no one had done at that point was to, you know, employ really good quantitative methods to look at the system. And that's where Alex came in. And the two really big methodological differences that she introduced were first of all to use sort of Lebovian type methods looking across, but also to build this incredible... So I should say, this she's in an outstation, like a little community of about 40 people. 
This is not a huge number of people. And, and they, they all grow up speaking the language, so it's not a language shift situation, even though there's a, some you know, changes like there are in any language. So she, as well as doing this sort of detailed work in that one community, she assembled a corpus from a whole bunch of people who had worked on the language before, um, the oldest being, sometimes they were just written down, sometimes they were also audio recorded. The oldest texts were in 1951, um, and they, then they went right up till now. Um, and the, she transcribed about 27 hours, um, still about 100 to go, and that gives 48,000 plus words, which is more than it seems, given that it's a polysynthetic language. So, you know, a word can have a lot of stuff in it. It could be 10 syllables long, and you need two English sentences to translate it. Uh, and the date of birth range, this, this is probably the, old, well, the widest time range corpus we currently have for an Australian language, more than 100 years from the date of birth of the youngest to the oldest speakers. So now what this shows is here, here we've got it's basically the same thing that I showed you before. Maybe what I should have drawn your attention to, I'll just zoom back to that slide. It's sort of implicit in the colorations I've given you. It's not just about building a nice matrix where every cell is filled, but the actual forms, the, the ne for the unit augmented and the ri for the augmented, uh, you know, they said, well, this is a nice value with a nice form uh, encoding it. So that's that same uh, thing again there. Uh, the, what we can think of as the canonical or classical uh, version of the language that was first described, although with a less elegant analysis, in the first grammar of the language by Lynette Oates in 1964. And then Peter Carroll wrote a master's thesis, I, I wrote a grammar, uh, and we all took this as being how the language works. Uh, but then she looked through the corpus and um, the rarest of those prefixes is this one, the, the Kane one, which is the only trial, as I said, the only one that denotes a group of three people. Even in the oldest part of the corpus, it's got pretty low frequency. So it comes in rare and then it disappears, basically. So there's no one born after 1976 who ever uses this form. Um, and once you pull that out of the system, it's like pulling a card and a pack of cards collapse because it's that one form that shows you the difference between the two. Uh, one way of seeing it is you've just gener generalised the cutty form to cover both the unit augmented and augmented there. But then that's the same as, as this, right? That is just a, a normal kaido style absolute number system. So there, thanks to work like this, we can look at a particular typological change in progress, that is, in this case, between an absolute number system in pronouns and, and, and a relative one, uh, and show chart its time course, probably suggest you know, a fairly plausible uh, reason that is the rarest form didn't survive. You know, like it. Uh, but there could be other factors as well. So methodologically, it just shows that you can do this. You can link uh, microevolution and the sort of things that you can find in a uh, community and macroevolution, that is a change in typological parameters. So uh, just for the last thing I want to talk about today, uh, I want to talk about issues of comparability, which is a big topic, uh, and one you know we, we could have a whole course on it, uh, and and there's whole special issues of linguistic typology on it, and still a matter of lively debate. But I do want to point out how important it is, even though it's not straightforward, because all evolutionary accounts require us to track some form of comparable traits across different entities. 
we want to say this has one, this one doesn't. Or there's this intermediate form here. So we have to be taking whatever the entities are we're talking about and having a, um, a way of charting their distribution across whether they are languages or individuals or species or nodes in an evolutionary tree or whatever they are. Uh, we might need to do it in order to build a phylogeny. We might need to say tone languages arise in this branch of a language family uh, or we might say what factors cause them to evolve in some circumstances. Uh, but we can't s test a hypothesis like that unless we can say these languages have it, these don't, or these, speak, these individuals have it, these don't. But then uh, we have difficulties of comparability. So we mentioned last time, you know, sex. If you saw the, the slide of, you know, these mushrooms with 20,000 sexes, a very natural response is, well, that's not, it's not sex, it's something else, right? Uh, so people want to push back. Um, in linguistics, any number of terms that we use, like absolute, if, absolute number system or tone language or inclusive construction or adjective or transitive verb or lexeme meaning no or whatever it may be, we need to give some criteria for saying we count these ones, we don't. Or a grammar says this is a transitive verb for these reasons or this is an ergative construction for these reasons or whatever. So we need to be able to do it, but it's a non-trivial problem. So just I like to deal with these things by taking what looks like it should be a trivial problem. So sort of thing that Ian Madison would do in Sounds of the World's Languages, which languages have a P? That should be really easy to answer, right? Uh, so let's just look at four languages, uh, two of which have non-Latin orthographies independently developed that give us a good idea of how speakers see things. So in Hindi, well, and, and in all languages there is a phonetic P. That's not a problem. Uh, so, but in Hindi we've got pa, pa and ba. We can get minimal triplets like pal, pal and bal. And there's also a bal, but let's leave that out of account for the moment. And there's different letters in Devanagari script for those three. Uh, so P sort of sits in the middle, hemmed in on either side by these others. English, as we know, as we teach our students in first year, there's aspirated P in pin and there's unaspirated P in spin and English speakers tend not to even be aware that they're different sounds until they study uh, linguistics and no one is freaked out by writing them with the same letter or, or anything. Uh, but then B, that's another matter. You know, you, you better know which one you're, you're using or you'll face um, problems of misunderstanding. In Korean, this is slightly oversimplified, uh, but basically you've got an aspirated pa uh, written with one letter and an unaspirated p, which will be p in some environments, uh, like word initially, uh, and b in other environments, like intervocalically. So we've got, for example, p, the word p, uh, written with an aspirated P letter and then the word B word initially and shibibun as it is sometimes written, written but written with the same letter in Korean. So those two are considered allophones and sometimes when you will see uh, Korean romanized, you will see that English letter P used to represent the aspirated P and the English letter B written to use either of the others, right? So it's, it's a bit of a different system to how, how the um, pinyin system works because the phonology is different. And then you get to Kaidot and yeah, there's plenty of Ps, but the field is wide open. That is, there's just a single bilabial stop. Voicing is pretty free. So if I just take my, the word for my um, paternal grandmother, Babiju, I've heard it as papiju, papiju, babiju, papiju, 
whatever. You know, there's, you're free to choose that. So then the question is, which of these languages has a P phoneme? Let's just take a straw poll around who's here or who's in the chat. Sorry? There must be also another language reason why you analyze a B instead of a P for a hierarchy. Ah, uh, yeah, that's basically that has to do with relative frequency of, of, of one particular form of pronunciation, but it, it's not straightforward because in the most recent way I've started writing Kaido, because word finally in a word like bijarp, dugong, it will be devoiced like in German or Russian. So when I initially developed the orthography, I was writing that with a B in both places, but because now there aren't any native speakers, that's really hard for them in transfer from English context. So I've started using two different graphemes for the same phoneme. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But does anyone want to weigh in on this? You know, imagine that you are Ian Madison Mark II doing Sounds of the World Languages and you've got to make up your map or say... <laughs> Some other substance only yeah. Mm. Right? yeah, I mean, it's, it's really not a straightforward question to answer, right? I mean, because I, I, I think the answer could be one, two, three, or four. And you, you, you could, uh, the, the only reasonable answer to the question is, depends what you mean. Uh, or what do you mean? Uh, and then you argue about it and you give some criteria, like, like the one you're proposing or other ones, uh, and then you, know, you make a decision, but other people coding into the same database might, the, the more complicated the reasons you give, the higher the risk that your coders won't f follow the same coding principles. So that's just with a P, I mean, that, how, Easy as that compared to saying, you know, does this language have adjectives or does it have, you know, this form of relative clause or whatever. Um, once again, though, we should remember that we are not alone. Uh, some of the discussions and the angsting by, you know, my good friend Martin Haspelmath about this and uh, others, that um, it's a problem that besets. I'd say, if we can use a term like the historical sciences to mean the things that study the products of processes through time, which could be natural sciences like geology or biology, or could be human sciences like linguistics or anthropology or economics, it's all the same problem, actually. So this is an example that you may not be familiar with if you aren't familiar with Australian plants, but... Uh, Imagine we have a hypothesis, seems like a really reasonable hypothesis, that plants have small leaf surfaces in arid environments. So we all know that if, if we go into you know, a desert or some dry place, you're more likely to have pin leaves or things like that so that the plant doesn't have to trans, transpire so much. And in a very high rainfall environment, you get these lush, big leaves because it doesn't matter if you transpire, you'll get rain the next day. So that's good. You, you formulate that hypothesis and then you look at the Australian continent, but also I think this would apply for large parts of Africa too. Uh, and you happily go along measuring leaf sizes and so on, and then you encounter acacias and you get these weird things. I've given you a depiction of one um, acacia there, thanks to Jenny Green, who, who drew this, I actually have a photo, but it's a bit more messy. Uh, what happens with acacias is that the immature acacias have leaves. But as, as soon as they become adults, instead of the leaves, they have what are called phyllodes, which is the part right behind the leaf, which comes up. So basically the, the, um, the 
light is received and photosynthesis takes place in the phyllode. So the, the photosynthetic um, light receptors move backwards into the phyllode and the leaf just becomes this tiny little tip. And that's because the sort of woody part where the photosynthesis occurs you know, sheds less water. And then you get a little delicate moment in the life of these plants, just like, you know, we know teenagers who, you know, are they kids, are they adults? This you, and both probably. Um, you get plants that are like that uh, and you can see both types of leaf then. So then if you are doing this study of, you know, surface area to uh, aridity and so on, you face the question, well, which, which one am I going to measure when I do uh, acacias? Am, am I going to count the surface area of the phyllodes or of the leaves, uh, you, you get a very different answer. Or you might be an economist and you're interested in money. So you say, well, let's look at what societies have money, what things are, what are high value monetary objects. Uh, there's a really wonderful book if you're interested in Papuan stuff. Uh, this is the same group of people that Steve Levinson has written a lot about, the Yelignia people. And they're famous among anthropologists for their complex system of shell money. So they, and this uh, anthropologist or economic anthropologist called John Leap wrote a book called A Papuan Plutocracy. And they have all sorts of, sh they're obsessed with shells and they're sort of just everyday trading shells. And there are shells which are like sort of Mona Lisa shells that you, it's just one of them and you, they're family heirlooms and you sort of bury them in the ground and you keep their location secret and you get them out in secret and you know, admire them and put them back into the ground. And so on. Um, all sorts of stuff happens. But that has been called shell money. But some of it is maybe shell money. Would you call them Mona Lisa money? Probably not. Uh, it's an object of value, but it's a unique object and not a readily traded one. Uh, so that's one type of problem. Or the one on the right is one of those famous, um, what do they call the, those sovereigns with the, the bust of Maria Theresa um, Empress on them that was actually used as one point in history, I think it was the most widely circulated coin, it was used for trade in Africa and in other places. Um, so that was the... Uh, one point where it was valued, but it didn't necessarily have an ex fixed exchange rate. Like you couldn't necessarily have an exchange rate. One of those is with this many gold sovereigns or guilders or whatever at a certain point in history. Uh, and then at some point it did have a fixed exchange rate. And now it's still a coin. It's out of circulation. It's a highly valued collector's item, but it's not there. So then you're doing your you know, anthropology of money or whatever, what point do you count them or not? So these are just some other examples of these. Um, we have various ways of dealing with a problem uh, and it's a complex problem that I won't be able to you know, go right into uh, in this course, but I did want to flag it. So just to tie that um, discussion off, I'm just going to refer you to uh, some of the important articles on this. So a special issue of, of linguistic typology that's got four articles on uh, this theme, including one on Bar Darwin and Barnacles by Lyndall Bromham, and then uh, one on using um, canonical typology to tackle it by um, Eric Round and Grev Corbett, and a nice one by Matt Spike and one on comparability in sign language. So how do we establish comparability between units in sign language or constructions in sign language and those in um, spoken language? And then a number of articles by Martin Haspelmath, that's one of them, and a recent article by Nicholas Himmelmann. So in, in contrast to last time, I actually got through a little early, but uh, the advantage of that is we can leave a little time for questions and discussion, in, in, not just on this, uh, today's one, but also on the last one. Uh, and would be good to also help me know where everyone is at in terms of, you know, uh, 
what's, what's interesting, what's not, what, what people understand or what they would like to take further. So any questions among uh, the participants in the room? There is one by Tiago Zan who says, mm. having been first trained as a biologist, whenever I see this type of question, I tend to see it as a version of the question of homology. I was going to ask specifically about Hasberman's concept of comparative concepts versus mm -hmm. descriptive categories. So, yeah, so I, I think those are two rather different things. I would say that homology, as, as I understand it, and um, the Lyndall Bromham article about the barnacles in the linguistic typology uh, special issue talks about this, that homology is used for structures that have a common evolutionary origin, right? So, so if, if to say, if you compare the wings of two species of birds, uh, they are, the, there's a homology in the structure of their wings, which is different to what you get, in, say, in a, in a bat, because the different bones have merged together. Uh, but then the question of what counts as a wing or what counts as, let's say, tonal system. So let's say you say, yeah, this, this is a high tone in language. Um, languages can have independently evolved those, so you make taxonomic decisions about things being the same, which doesn't require that they have got to that point by the same evolutionary route. So for that reason, I don't, I don't know if Tiago wants to type something back, but I wouldn't regard uh, the equivalences we're talking about here as the same as homology in biology. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Please go ahead if you have questions. If you have any questions in the room, after we will look at the rest of the chat. Pendant que vous réfléchissez... Ah, pardon, sorry. Oh, hello, hello. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was really interesting. The part on all of it was really interesting. But on typological and socio, socio, or social variables, and you were talking about uh, examples of negation and copulas and quotatives. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on plus or minus copula construction and how that might fit in with a social social variable, mm. or if you had some study in mind? Well, there's been a lot of studies, especially on African-American populations, uh, where, you know, it's known that there's no copula in certain constructions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there were a number of studies of that, by Lebov and others, mm -hmm. where if you take English speakers in the United States, say, as a speech community, it's predominantly a marker of African American English, black, black English vernacular, it's been called at some points in the past, uh, signalling that pretty directly. So that would be a sociolinguistic use of the variable. Uh, and then you've got more complex conditioned uses, so say in Russian, where you have no copula in the present, no overt copula in the present tense of the spoken language, but in the written language you have this interesting device of putting in a long dash in the place where it would have been if it was there, uh, but you have it present in the past tense and in the future tense. Uh, and then there's issues of how, you know, what happens through the diachrony of that, but that's not a, that's not a sociolinguistic variable there. And then, of course, we have languages where you just have to put a copula in. I, I, I don't, so that, it, but it would be cases like the black English vernacular or a number of other, I, I mean, in Kaidel, that's an example of a language where you, you're pretty free about whether to put it in or not. Uh, or maybe you would even say that you're grammaticalizing towards a copula from a number of stance verbs like to remain and to sit and so on. Yeah, yeah. 
So the, the correspondence that you did, that you were that you were arguing for that we should look into is to, is this relation between the, the sociolinguistic variables and whether or not that provides the impetus for typological change again as you were showing us with the so that's what, that's what allows us to look at how social factors are being tied on to uh, particular typological changes. So, so let's say we, <coughs> we make a strong hypothesis that there will be some, what I'll call downhill changes. They're just easy, they could happen anywhere, anytime. It's just really normal for languages to do this, like in a, S becoming H or K becoming parallelized before G or something. No special pleading needed to explain what. And then you've got very unusual things that are creating odd structures and the idea would be these would only arise under very special circumstances, possibly socially marked to exclude outsiders or things like that. But you can only read, you, you can just sort of survey and say, yeah, it's found in this society, this society, this society, not this. These societies have that characteristic. But really to understand what's going on, you've got to see the change in progress as it's going and what social meaning it is invested with as it, as it develops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it could go either way, couldn't it? You a movement towards zero copularization where you eliminate the use of B as in the vernacular English, or could uh, also be involved in the development of the Yeah. So then, then there'll be quite a lot of bi directional changes as well that can e equally go in either direction. Yeah. Thanks. Including, including a lot of movements in the vowel space, for example. Yeah, I have a question. I'm trying to formulate my battery that they couldn't, but they should shoot out the question anyway. Um, I understood that we could make a divide between the actuation of changes and the, the spread of those changes in, in, a, uh, in a language or in a society. And from what I understood, the actuation can be related to bias in cognition or in the motor, motor control of the, of the body, while the other aspect of the change has to be always um, socially based somehow. Uh, I'm not sure if this is quite radical from what you're saying, but my, my impression is that we cannot talk about any kind of change that ultimately does not go through some kind of social structure, mm. uh, which has to do with selection and spreading of that change. And if that's the case, then uh, we are selecting everything even though we are not aware uh, of what we are selecting that, in, in that sense. That, that, there comes the idea of the third kind, uh, the thing you were saying, right? So some features that change, some element that change could be related to a social idea, so some, some aspect of ideology of conscience about it, but others are not so much, but it's still they, they go through some kind of social feature or social aspect. Is this yeah. uh, more or less in the way you want us to follow? <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, examples of the, I'll, I'll give some in the next class, of, um, changes of the third kind, that it could be that you have some linguistic ideology which says, you know, all clans have their own way of speaking, for example, but they don't prescribe what those ways are. But then there's variation which is just out there in a broader, say a multi-dialectal or even multilingual speech community, and then that gets selected for because you know, both of us might be doing exactly the same variation uh, and it might be that both of us say A 70% of the time and B 30% of the time or whatever it might be, but then the general view, oh, well, Nick and Tiago from a different claims, the reason Tiago's saying this and I'm doing that is because they are um, 
speakers from different clans. Right? So then it imposes particular social interpretations on change that's not actually representing what we're doing, but what people's idea that there should be these types of social distinction. But in, in going back to the earlier part of your question, uh, the propagation problem, I think that that's not independent of the sort of psychosensory motor things. Because if, the propag if changes get propagated differentially, that is some are better suited for some kinds of signalling than others, uh, that might reflect the fact that some of those are more difficult to produce. So then they'll be harnessed for a different sort of signalling purpose. Yeah. Well, there will never be some kind of impairment of whatever is possible with language because you always find things that they must be possible from a cognitive or a motor perspective, right? So there is no way you can go out on what is possible with cognition, right? Language cannot prove what's impossible with cognition, I think. So we're kind of like trapped in this idea of what cognition is. Uh, what is interesting is that the, the rare phenomenon that we see in, in certain kinds of changes, they really impose pressure on, this, on the transmission of, of language and learnability of it. But it's still the social aspect, that, as you were saying, so they're, they're a rare phenomenon. There's a reason they, they survive and they're kept within that community, even though they would be more difficult to, to emerge as a change or to be maintained as a system. So it looks like the social aspect of the propagation and the continuous transmission of, of the language is paramount, I think, at some point, um, compared to other more um, cognitive or, or, or physical aspect of, of, of language. I think, I mean, again, starting with the, your first point, and turning it around the other way, there have been quite a number of cases where things that have been claimed to be impossible, mm -hmm. sometimes invoking cognitive reasons, turn out to be attested mm -hmm. in some languages. So that's just about widening out our understanding of the design space through what I was calling last time, you know, long tail phenomena. I mean, if the further something is out in the long tail, the longer it will take to find examples of that for the science of linguistics. You just have to look at more cases. Um, then in terms of, let me see how to put this. For the second part of your question, could you just repeat the way you put it? Because I'm, yeah. What I was trying to say is that when you talk about the propagation of a change within a social group, or even in the transmission, replication of linguistic system into new generations, there is always a social element, social filter or, or motivation mm. that is fundamental, um, whether to the maintenance or yeah. to the yeah. innovation. Okay. So now I, I know what I wanted to say, that um, when we talk about things that are very rare, they might be rare because they're difficult. You know, that, so that is in, in terms of the sort of Chater and um, Christensen model. It's sort of, they wouldn't naturally get through their learner bottleneck, right? It's just sort of highly unlikely. Or uh, the social circumstances that create them might be rare. But there's another possibility that, no, they're fine. People can learn them easily. But the number, the particular evolutionary pathway that would give rise to it involves so many steps that are themselves a little unusual that it's just hard for them to evolve. But once they're there, people learn them easily. Yeah, with regard to linguistic diversity versus biological diversity, some cases of certain feature combinations in languages can be explained by a language context.
example R E I N in Chinese. I'm not quite sure what that means, which is just Relativiza negative relativization. <coughs> a real noun, must be real noun, yeah, in Chinese, which is an SVO language. In biology, horizontal transmission is present only in certain groups of organisms, mostly simple ones, if I remember correctly. This issue is also widely discussed in historical linguistics, but since most of the typological features are easier to be borrowed than basic vocabulary, how should typologists modify biology model metaphor to also account for contact-induced change? So look, two, two points here. I think that we make a mistake in constantly borrowing vertebrate-based models, you know, because, I mean, evolutionary biology isn't just about large and complex organisms. It includes, you know, all the way down to, to viruses and even prions, where horizontal transfer is, occurs much more easily. But you never see the models from, say, a virologist's textbook of evolution used in a linguistics thing. We all, you know, so I, th I think that if we look further there, we'll have much better models. And you know, as we speak and people try and understand the evolution of COVID, I mean, virologists are bu busy, busily at work modelling horizontal transmission of you know, things that help get around vaccines or whatever they do. Uh, so that's the first part. The second part in terms of this, what you say, Alexandra, that um, type, most typological features are easier to be borrowed than basic vocabulary. I'm not sure that that's true. I, I think um, there are some features which can be easily borrowed and others that can't. And I, I think it's an open question uh, and that you know, we, we can easily give examples, especially, for example, word order and stuff. Um, but other ones that aren't. And something else that I'm going to talk about in the last class, that I think it's wrong to always focus on convergence as, as a result of language content. You can also get divergence. And in a way, it's harder to uh, account for that, except once we bring in this idea of you know, being a phenomenon of a third kind. That is, you, you want to sound different from another group. Uh, and you harness your knowledge of multiple systems to make sure that you've gone off to another part of that space. Mm. I had another question yeah. on mm. stable linguistic or stable sociolinguistic variables being harder to detect. Well, prima facie, I thought, well, wouldn't that be the opposite? The, you know, they're talking about varieties of English. Uh, no, that was stable typological Ty variables, not yeah. stable. So, because I mean, like for example, it's been claimed that n and ng in English are a pretty stable social linguistic variable in the sense that they've been around for a thousand years or however long it is. But it's these ones like what uh, Joanna Nichols claims are highly stable. But I think we have to take that with a grain of salt. Actually, I mean, uh, she really means aerially stable. But that's not the same as meaning that they, you know, will be sociolinguistically stable. Could be, it could be just that there's um, fewer pathways to produce them in some areas. You know. So that gets back to this question about pathway dependency. If you've got an innovation that can result from lots of different factors, it's going to happen frequently. But innovations that there's just one pathway to get there, they, they're going to be harder. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting that what he said about um, the degree of uh, awareness or blindness to variation in a group or their tolerance to, to variation. And I was wondering, uh, because I, I experienced that in some, in some groups, people are pretty prescriptive about some things, but not others. And uh, recently we were working on this. For example, I, um, I witnessed lots of metaphysics in, in words. Mm. And when I presented that to people, I said, okay, so which one is wrong? Is this one right? Is this one right? No, we all, we all say that. It's okay. It's the same thing. Yeah. 
And similar to what he said, they were not even aware of that, whereas they probably constantly hear them, but it was completely integrated and, and they didn't care. So I was wondering if um, you had any ideas about where does this tolerance to variation stop? And uh, mm -hmm. is it is something sort of simple? So I think, I mean, if we go back to that slide I had about oops, um, this one, socially embedded typological questions, right? I think there's a couple of different issues here. So one is, in general, are speech communities more uniform? There seem to be some where there's just this real pressure for uniformity. And it doesn't matter which way you step out of line, someone will pounce on you. And other ones where it's just like, yeah, people speak differently. That's what they do. Uh, that's certainly what Alex Marley found in her study. She often was confronted or confronted people. Uh, there were, for example, there's a funny thing in the pronoun paradigm that if I say you singular, like let's say I say you went, I'll say ye one. Uh, and if I say you two went, I would say mune wam, and then you more than two muri wam. So there's this suppletion ye. Now, some younger speakers are building the non singulars on the singular base. So they're saying things like yini wam, yiri wam, creating these new forms. And because she had arrived and was hanging out with, you know, people 10, 15, 18, they're saying, no, you've got to speak like that, like us, you know, don't speak like an old fuddy-duddy, you know. Um, and then she thought that old, she thought the older people would really jump on her and say, no, no, you've got to learn a proper form of the language. Um, they said, oh, yeah, well, it's, yeah, young people speak like that, yeah, it's all right, that's how they speak. You know, so, so this sort of high level of tolerance for, for difference there. So that's one part of it. But the other part of it, which I think is a more complex but maybe interesting question is, are there some changes which people are just going to notice more easily in whatever language? And are there some which will sort of naturally go under the radar? And um, it's quite possible, but interesting to know. Or, or that might be relativised so that there are some parts of the world where people are really sensitised to some sorts of things. For example, there's a view that I mentioned earlier that vowels are really good social signalers. Uh, and if you speak English, you assume that, but also some other languages of Europe and so on, maybe elsewhere in the world. But I haven't seen a description of any Australian language where vowel quality is the sort of carries sociolinguistic information. There's other ways you do it, but you don't use vowels for that. So there, there, there could be things where these are sort of large scale aerial effects, uh, almost like you know, a linguistic ideology shared over a large area that this is, this is where you do your signaling. And those other things, well, Whatever. Or could it, sorry, could it be that it depends on the impact that those changes have on the whole system? Right. I'm thinking of, uh, in Berber, the um, um, state distinction between annexed and absolute. People, it's really a no-no for people mm. to accept uh, variation in this respect, like m using one for the other. Whereas uh, using one pattern of plural um, construction, or plural um, template instead of another, or using gemination instead of prefixing for mm. imperfective, this is acceptable to a mm. certain degree. Uh, and this is local in some ways, whereas for the um, state distinction, it's a wide um, it's a distinction that has impact on the whole system mm. at many levels of the grammar. So maybe there is something. So like that's this. A, another hypothesis, right? That there are some changes that are just. It, it would be too important, too yeah. disastrous, mm -hmm. if they happened. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to regard that as no more than a hypothesis yeah, too, yeah. because it, it might be that languages are incredibly tolerant, and, and you can just sort of 
allow disasters to happen, you know, through yeah. some small store that breaks down. Then you just rebuild it some, yeah, yeah, exactly. some other way. But yeah. it, mm. it's, the consequence is a huge re rebuilding. Mm. It's not just one tiny part yeah. that you have to adapt to. Mm. It's just that you have to reconsider a number of contexts and reorganize the whole thing mm. instead of having to adapt to a small change at some point mm -hmm. in the grammar. Yeah, that's why people can be tolerant to metaphysics because it doesn't really matter. Like, they understand it so mm. But then if you change something in the morphology, change something deep in the grammar, then maybe they, people start being oh, and maybe they'll say that. Uh, it mm. But it does depend a lot because, say, so for example, in those, that bit in Gunwok dialect chain, uh, which I was talking about, uh, there's at the very least sort of six main dialects in a population of about a thousand people, speakers, but there's certainly further variability within that. But morphological differences are really strong there. And that's the first thing people will tell you about, both in the gender forms of the gender markers, the agreement pattern with gender markers, the forms of the pronominal prefixes, the forms of the tense suffixes on the verbs. There are lots of places in the morphology, both of nouns and verbs, and determiners, where morphological difference has heavy social signification. It's not exactly what you were talking about. But still, mm. Mm. In the, the English of great vowel shift, that was a, that's a major restructuring. And if you imagine that English speakers since the Middle Ages signal the social aspects of vowels, so that would be another thing that you can do both change the entire system of vowels and one keep uh, vowels as a social uh, important aspect of. Yeah, and it, it's not like you don't want to keep sociolinguistic variables. You do want to keep some uh, parts where you can signal this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, as you said, it, convergence is not uh, a goal in, in itself. I want to go back, maybe if there is more other questions. I want to go back to the idea of, of these uh, social aspects of change, so the, the propagation of change and the actuation of change, uh, this contrast. Maybe discuss a little bit the idea of uniform, uniformitarianism, uniformitarianism, because to what extent can we, can we hold that, <coughs> okay, Certainly, socially, we have lots of variation in human societies and culture as well. And there is no, if you think about history, there is never a society that's equal to each other mm. at point in time. So, but at the same time, we tend to believe that cognitively and, and physically we have the same uh, uh, situation. So there is one aspect that makes us believe that there is a uniform military principle of language change and, and organization, but at the same time there is something that's infinitely uh, non-uniform. Mm. So, I don't know, I wanted to get your thoughts around, uh, around typological variation and, and uniform uniformitarianism. So I think the first thing is that when we talk about uniform materialism, it's always a question of at what level are we claiming uniformity? So for example, you might have a uniform, uniformitarian postulate that all speech communities use some linguistic differences to s signal social differences. Right? I mean, that would be a very general one and probably true. Mm -hmm. uh, or you might want to make it more specific. So you might want to say languages are more likely to use subtle differences in vowel quality than they are differences in word order to signal. So then you've got lots and lots of variance as you get more and more specific. Um, and I think because any science, you know, you want to become as precise as you can, there's 
reasons to favour the more specific versions as, as just a matter of scientific preference, that is, you want those accounts. But then each time you make them more precise, you have to be, they're harder to falsify because you have to look over a larger number of case studies. And it might be that you know, you've got to look to a particular continent, for example, or you know, another language family that hasn't been studied before, before you can falsify it. It could be useful to do a social signaling, a cross-linguistic study of social signaling in different areas of the world to really test which one of those, uh, which features in languages in, in a particular system can be more uh, recurrently used as ways to, to call so social distinction or social identity. Yeah, and you might have just, you know, you might break social signaling down into different types, so for example, signaling of the gender of the speaker or signaling of deference or signaling of formality or you know like various types that probably all humans do uh, they might be signaled by different different means